In today's video, we're talking about the differences between genomic genetic testing, also somatic and germline. These are questions we get quite often from prostate cancer patients. And so today, Dr. Mark Schulz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer, is gonna answer our questions. So Dr. Scholz, in today's video, I thought we would talk about genetic testing. I think that there are a lot of questions that come up when patients are, you know, researching prostate cancer, and then they see that there's all these genetic tests available, but they wanna know, you know, there's so many different terminologies. What's genomic testing? What's genetic testing? And how do you differentiate between the two? And how does it really apply to choosing a treatment? So can we just break down, first of all, what is the difference between, what's the definition, I would say, between genetic testing and genomic testing? Not much difference. The idea of the genome is to talk about all the DNA in your body. And so if they run through the whole genome looking for mutations anywhere in the genome, you say that's genomic testing. Genetic testing may be where they're just looking for a specific genetic abnormality and, uh, and not researching the whole genome. When it comes to prostate cancer, how important is it to get genetic or genomic testing? If you back up a step and think about genes as uh, representing, you know, the undergirding of, of everything we are as living beings. The use of the Gleason score is a type of genetic testing where you're looking at the manifestation of the appearance of the cells under the microscope, and it's going to tell you about how those cells will behave over time compared to cells that look differently. So when we dig deeper and we go to the actual genes that cause these things that we can see with our eyes under the microscope, that is a way of also trying to predict what uh, th that particular genetic abnormality will manifest over time. Is it going to create a fast-growing tumor, a tumor that spreads more easily, a tumor that's uh, perhaps resistant to treatment? So these are uh, always a work in process. So we can identify a lot of genetic abnormalities, but we don't always have a full picture of how that's going to manifest in terms of the cancer behavior over time. The reason that that can be a problem is it's not just one gene that's causing that behavior. It may be one gene that's contributing to the behavior, like a player on the team, uh, on a basketball team. It's not one player that makes or breaks whether the team wins or loses, but it contributes. Other genes, other uh, issues are going to also affect how that tumor is going to behave over time. And we're still learning about that. Uh, the biggest gene that's talked about in prostate cancer is BRCA1 and BRCA2. And uh, we know that those genes do have a uh, predictive component for making the cancer behave a little more aggressively. Uh, we also know that those types of cancers may respond to certain PARP inhibitor medications. So these are useful tests, but they're not uh, providing all the answers in terms of what's necessary for selecting therapy uh, in, um, in each individual. Please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells the YouTube algorithm that these videos were helpful for you, and they'll push our videos out to other people who need them on the platform. Also, if you would like to donate to our cause, you could do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schulz. So let's get into BRCA1 and BRCA2 really quick. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it means that it's breast, prostate cancer, and colon cancer, and it's in 5% of the population. Is that accurate? Well, it's 5% of men uh, who are newly diagnosed, but more like 10 to 15% of men that develop the more advanced stages of prostate cancer. So if it's in 10 to 15% of the population, does that mean that men who have this, you know, BRCA2 or BRCA1 variation, um, does that mean that they, all men in prostate cancer should get this test to see if they are BRCA1 or BRCA2 positive because they would have treatments that apply to them specifically? Well, the treatments that are being used, the PARP inhibitors, are uh, reserved for men with advanced prostate cancer. There are some doctors that uh, advocate for all men, for example, going on active surveillance to be tested to see if they have BRCA mutation. As uh, some theorize that those individuals may be more likely to progress, have their cancer grow over time than people that don't have that mutation. I don't specify that in my patients because we know we're going to be watching all these patients very closely anyway, and we're not convinced that everyone with BRCA1, BRCA2 is going to develop progressive uh, prostate cancer when they're on active surveillance, you know, very promptly. I, I don't think that's the case at all. But uh, there are other experts that are arguing for testing it in everybody, and, and some experts have said that uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 patients shouldn't do active surveillance, which I disagree with. So I'm not 
testing those early stage individuals routinely, but uh, patients who have uh, any type of metastatic disease, uh, any patients who have hormone resistant disease, those individuals are potential candidates for PARP inhibitors, and you'd want to know if that uh, mutation is present because the PARP inhibitors uh, work quite well in those patients. So when I'm reading about genetic and genomic testing, I see terms like somatic and I see terms like germline. What do those terms mean? Mutations can occur in the cancer. Mutations can also occur in our normal bodies. If you're testing to see if someone's a BRCA carrier, in other words, that they got it from their parents, that would be germline testing. If you're testing the tumor itself, uh, for example, with cell-free DNA or a, a biopsy, and it sh shows up as a BRCA mutation in the tumor, which is likely if the, if the host has it, but uh, you can have BRCA mu mutations in whom the host doesn't have the BRCA mutation. And so if you test BRCA in the tumor itself and it's positive, that's called somatic mutation. So there are a lot of different tests on the market. You know, we have Polaris, we have Decipher, we have, you know, Myriad. There's all sorts of tests. And what do you use in your practice and when do you use them? So those particular uh, assays, uh, genetic tests, are to try and help men decide if it's safe to do active surveillance or not. They look at the genetic makeup of uh, men who were placed on observation many years ago and those that had uh, more rapid or more uh, significant cancer progression were graded as having higher grade tumors based on their DNA profile. The problem with the, with the reporting format, I don't have any trouble with the de genetic testing, helping people understand if they have a, a more or less aggressive tumor. This is mostly decided already by the Gleason score, so I don't do genetic testing in Gleason 6 patients. Um, one might consider doing it in the patient who's considering doing active surveillance in a Gleason 7 patient, a 3 plus 4, to try and determine if it's uh, a more aggressive seven or a less aggressive seven. I'm not using the testing as much as I did previously because the reporting formats from these are giving the results of people who were treated 20 years ago where the outcomes were a lot worse. We didn't have MRIs, we didn't have PET scans, we didn't know as much about prostate cancer back then. And uh, I, these reports come back talking about 10-year uh, mortality rates in men on active surveillance. Anyone that in this modern era that goes on active surveillance is not going to die of prostate cancer in less than 10 years. So the format that they're using to report is outdated. But it does profile people and give you a sense of low, intermediate, high chances for more aggressive disease. Um, but I'm not finding it as useful as I used to think it was. And so just to, to get a deeper understanding, when you say that no one on active surveillance in the next 10 years is going to die, is that because of the monitoring process of an active surveillance patient and the procedures that they go through to make sure that their cancer is not going and rising and progressing through the body? Yeah, modern men that go on active surveillance should have a well-performed MRI. And if they are monitored closely over the uh, time period, of observation, and if they have a more aggressive tumor type, they're going to uh, pick that up at an early stage and most likely be cured. They're not going to die. The idea of people dying in less than 10 years on active surveillance is talking about mismanaged patients or old-fashioned treatment that we had 20 years ago. So in previous conversations with Dr. Moyad, I've seen from a conference that you both were discussing the impact of getting genetic testing. And there's you know, sometimes too much information and too little information that patients are looking at. And so in what situations besides choosing after surveillance or BRCA testing, would you have a patient do genetic testing and say, this is really a good idea for you? For healthy people that are just want to look into their genes and find out what's going on under the hood, you have to decide, are you a, an emotional person that's going to ruminate about uns uncertainties and unanswered questions? There's a lot of genes that they don't even know what they do yet. If those sorts of ambiguities don't bother you, sure, go ahead. But if, if you're the sort of person that lays awake at night wondering about all the things that can go wrong in life, uh, finding out that you have some mutation that no one understands may create consternation that you don't want to live with. So I think you have to look at that aspect in advance for people who are otherwise healthy and maybe don't, don't have to have genetic testing. The other situation we use genetic testing in is in men that have advanced prostate cancer that have been th through various treatments and uh, really trying to come up with new options for progressive metastatic hormone resistant disease and uh, checking uh, cell-free DNA through tests like Garden360 or Foundation One can detect mutations 
that have been discovered in other cancer types for which pharmaceutical agents have been developed to counteract those mutations. It's just as we have PARP inhibitors for BRCA mutations, there are other medications for the mutations that are seen commonly in lung cancer, pancreas cancer, and, and the like. And theoretically, prostate cancer patients that have those other mutations might respond to those medicines that are used in those other tumor types. So the uh, cell-free DNA Garden 360 and Foundation One tests could be useful for maybe finding a treatment when you're running out of options. So once you get those results, you know, does a patient go to their doctor and then have those types of conversations? Is there a genetic counselor that helps interpret it? How does that process go? The uh, reporting format is pretty robust. They'll comment in uh, the, the reports that if there's this specific mutation that there are medicines or clinical trials that are being utilized to counteract that particular mutation. So discussion with your phys uh, physician about how to access those clinical trials or even order that medicine to uh, see if it's going to be helpful, be a logical next step. Oftentimes I've had patients come up to me and say, hey, I had this genetic test done and now it's given me these results and I'm quite worried because it says high risk or something that they're concerned about within the report. How do you tell patients to talk to their doctor and how would you counsel them so that they can really get clarity on what the report says if something does come across that they are in a high-risk category. I assume you're talking about somatic testing with uh, Prolaris, Oncotype, or Decipher, uh, which is administered to men who are relatively newly diagnosed, some of whom are considering going on active surveillance. The way I would counsel those individuals is to try and put it in the context of the other known predictive factors. It's not the only predictive factor. We've got Gleason score, we've got Tumor volume is judged by the size of the tumor on MRI or perhaps the number of cores on a random biopsy. How high the PSA is. How long has the patient been under observation already? Have they done well? Does their PET scan show that disease is all confined in the prostate? Then add the genetic testing information on top of all that baseline. We're looking at the, the overall picture of everything that we've used historically to predict an individual's outcome over time based on other people that had that same profile and who were watched over time. The first step is to identify where people fit in this spectrum of harmless cancer to more consequential cancer. And then once we have that information figured out, then you can add the genetic testing on top of that and say, well, maybe we need to move it a little worse or move it a little bit lower, depending on whether it's unfavorable or favorable. And are these types of tests you know, covered by insurance and Medicare? Yes, they are. Yeah, we've had uh, very good fortune in getting insurance coverage for uh, genetic testing, especially for Medicare. And uh, I think private insurances have been pretty friendly to it as well. It sounds like to me, it's not really a matter of all men getting tested. It's really a matter of using these tools specifically and strategically in certain situations along the prostate cancer journey to add information when you're about to make a decision. I think a lot of people look at genetic and genomic testing and saying, okay, well, I'm going to find out this massive amount of information about my prostate cancer, and then I can make a treatment decision on a very generalized scale. But it sounds like it really needs to be strategic when they're used. Yes, and I think we might want to mention one other genetic test we've mentioned on, uh, on previous occasion, and that is to detect people who may not tolerate radiation therapy very well. Radiation therapy in mo these modern years is tolerated very well by the vast majority of people. But there are certain people whose genetics don't uh, lead to complete healing after radiation therapy, and those uh, genetic variations can now be detected. There's a company called Meridex that makes a um, product that's tested on your blood or, or a mouse swab called Prostox. For men that are thinking about doing SBRT, stereotactic body radiation, which is high-dose radiation given over uh, in five treatments very quickly, uh, certain individuals, maybe 5% of the population, is going to have uh, more lingering uh, healing problems after the radiation than the other 95%. So that's another form of genetic testing that is aimed at a very specific subgroup and can be useful. So you've treated thousands of men with prostate cancer, being a medical oncologist who specializes in prostate cancer. So have you ever seen a you know, somatic test or any of these tests really change how a patient would choose treatment. The most clear-cut one is in men who have advanced disease and turn out to be BRCA positive. So we know then we have another arrow in the quiver. We can use PARP inhibitors to, uh, with high expectations for effective anti-cancer therapy. For men with early stage disease who are doing the Prolaris Oncotype and Decipher type testing, uh, as I mentioned before, it's gonna be something that might move the needle a little bit up or down 
but if someone was making a decision about their future care on a genetic test alone, I'd say they're making a big mistake. You have to look at the underlying uh, factors like Gleason score and, and size of tumor, age of the patient, um, and then you can add the genetic testing for those early stage individuals to see if you're kind of waffling one way or another, maybe uh, it could tilt you toward treatment or away from treatment, but I would never use it as a standalone just to decide whether or not to do active surveillance. So as we talked about genetic testing and genomic testing, one of the key takeaways I had are that these are strategic things that can be used across the prostate cancer journey. So a discussion point you could have with your doctor is, is this an option for me? And if it is, how does it apply to my prostate cancer case? And if you get the results, let's say you go through one of these tests and there's anything concerning on the reports, you know, go ahead and talk to your doctor about this. Get your concerns answered. You wanna make sure you have a medical team that answers your questions and honors them and says, hey, yes, this is a concern and here is the answer and here's how it applies to your case. Everything in prostate cancer is very specific and you can use these tools strategically. Another thing that's a great option for a lot of people that are getting these reports is the companies that make them have genetic counselors, they have different tools online to help you interpret this information and you could use this to also talk to your doctor about how it applies to your case. You know, a big thing that we really believe in here at PCRI is shared decision making. And shared decision making means a lot of things to a lot of people, but to us what it means is that you're having an open dialogue with your doctor, you're sharing in the decision of what treatment you're going to go through, you're paying attention to the side effects that may come with that, and you're paying attention to your emotional and mental health through that process. I think it's a very important thing to pay attention to because quality of life matters so much when you're going through this prostate cancer journey because the patients who are being treated for prostate cancer are going through it for quite a long period of time. And so it's good to know that as you go through this prostate cancer journey that you're taking care of all aspects of who you are through that process. Now, if you would like more information or need help with any of the conversation that we had with Dr. Scholz today, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through that journey. They've had the testing themselves, and they can give you information about it and share their experiences. They give you information, not advice, but they help you build up your questions for your doctor so that, again, you can go into that doctor's office and have that experience of having shared decision making when you're making these decisions for your appointments. Now, um, if you would like more information about anything else we talked about, you can go to pcri.org. Our website is full of helpful information just like this video. Also, please like and subscribe. This helps the video be shared on the platform. And if you have other topics or comments you would like us to cover, you can leave them in the question section or comment section below this video. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please remember, you're not alone.